Mr. President. Senator from Idaho. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I rise to speak about the devastating tax and spend policies we will shortly be debating here. First, I want to differentiate between the bipartisan infrastructure legislation we're currently debating and the separate, looming debate on my Democratic colleagues' $3.5 trillion reckless tax and spend proposals. Senators on both sides of the aisle have long agreed to the need to modernize and expand our hard infrastructure, including transportation systems and broadband networks. We've done so in a bipartisan manner. Infrastructure investments have traditionally been accomplished through bipartisanship and regular order. Traditional hard infrastructure investments include funding of roads and bridges, transit, rail, airports, drinking water and wastewater infrastructure, ports and inland waterways, water storage, and broadband infrastructure. The bipartisan infrastructure bill we are considering today focuses on those core elements and is built around several vetted, unanimously consented committee passed bills. It includes a number of priorities important to Idaho, including billions of dollars for roads, highways, and bridges, funding for high speed internet and broadband infrastructure deployment, millions in water infrastructure, including for groundwater storage and conveyance, funding for resiliency against natural disasters like wildfires and droughts, a reauthorization of the Secure Rural Schools program, and much more. It does not raise taxes. It reprioritizes the use of certain unused COVID relief funds from previous spending bills away from bailouts and idle funds and towards supply, so, supply side investments that will provide benefits to the American people for many years. Because this infrastructure spending focuses on long-term productivity rather than near-term demand, it will not be inflationary. In fact, it will counteract the inflationary pressures we are now seeing as a result of the excessive spending in this Congress. This is especially critical right now, as rising prices are impacting families and small businesses across America. In June, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that consumer prices were up 5.4% over one year ago, the largest increase since August 2008. Consumer price inflation has been accelerating since the beginning of the year, and American families pay the price. In the past year, gas prices have increased 45.1%. The cost for major appliances has increased 13.7%. Airfares have increased 24.6%. And the list goes on. A recent University of Michigan survey showed that consumers expect prices to rise 4.8% over the next 12 months and a National Federation of Independent Business survey found that 47% of companies are increasing average selling prices, up seven percentage points from May, and the highest share in four decades. Economists on both sides of the aisle have warned that excessive, non-productive spending could put us in this position. And despite these warnings, in March, the Democrats passed a nearly $2 trillion in purported COVID relief spending on top of the nearly $4 trillion that had already been spent. A fraction of this $2 trillion was actually pandemic related. That poorly targeted package has grown the national debt, spurred inflation, and discouraged workers from returning to the workforce. Now, Democrats are proposing to spend an additional $3.5 trillion to balloon the federal government even more. And that's just the advertised price. According to the nonpartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, the Democrats' new legislation will actually cost closer to $5 to $5.5 trillion over the next 10 years. Democrats intend to couple this runaway spending with job and growth-killing tax hikes to form 
to create and establish their reckless spree of tax and spend policies. They intend to go it alone with this social spending spree through another budget reconciliation process in a 50-50 tied Senate, which is willfully partisan. Yet amazingly, despite having the tools to raise the debt limit within this process, Democrats want to ignore the debt implications of their reckless budget. If the Democrats are going to cram down this massive tax and spending spree, they will have to deal with the debt limit themselves. Yet they don't include dealing with their irresponsible growth of our debt in their bill. What about offset proposals? The Democrats' budget proposals include provisions that will cause immediate and long-term damage to our economy and send many of our most successful businesses and the jobs they provide abroad. One, they propose increasing taxes on all kinds of businesses, large and small, leading to lower wages, fewer jobs, and higher prices for consumers. Two, they would allow and encourage rival countries to change the international tax system for the worse. Three, they want to raise our taxes on our businesses in hopes that other countries may raise theirs sometime in the indefinite future while ceding U.S. taxing rights to our competitors today. Four, they propose enacting a double death tax, particularly harmful for family farms and small businesses. Five, they want to substantially increase taxes on investors, entrepreneurs, savers, and retirees. Six, they want to drastically expand the powers of the IRS while limiting its accountability and turn banks into private investigators for monitoring law-abiding Americans. Seven, their ideas will raise taxes on middle-class individuals and families and not just those earning over $400,000. At the very same time, they want tax relief for some of the wealthy living in the high tax and spend states. And finally, they're also seeking to impose government price controls on the pharmaceutical industry that will stifle medical innovation. Let's go back into a little detail on this. Business taxes. The Democrats plan to hike the tax rate paid by all types of businesses including corporations, ignoring the fact that a significant portion of the tax burden is paid by workers. As the U.S. Chamber of Commerce notes, most corporations are small businesses, with 84% of them having fewer than 20 employees. As to those who actually bear the burden of a corporate tax increase, estimates say that workers share anywhere from 20 to more than 70% of this burden. A higher corporate tax rate would hit the nest eggs of everyone saving for retirement. This stealthy but very real tax hike would hit retirement savers across the spectrum, falling most heavily on the middle class and the elderly through retirement accounts and pensions, and clearly violating President Biden's pledge not to tax anyone making less than $400,000. Any business tax increase will directly hit the very small businesses and workers that the administration claims it wants to help. International taxes. The Democrats' tax plan would reverse the smart policies of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act adopted in 2017, once again raising the relative cost of doing business in America and punishing American businesses selling their products or services overseas. They fail to acknowledge that the tax increases in their plan will rocket the United States back into the outlier position it once occupied compared to peer nations. Once again, we will have the highest tax rates of the developed world. We're very near the top. The Democrats are intent on winning a race to get to the top of the heap in terms of international corporate tax rates. Their international tax proposal would more than double the minimum rate paid by U.S. businesses on their foreign earnings to a 26.25%. This hike far outstrips the 15% minimum rate promised by some of our largest international competitors at the OECD. 
If the administration wants to promote economic growth that will benefit American workers and savers, why is it sharply increasing taxes on its global businesses when no other country even levies such taxes? The administration's international tax proposals seem designed to reignite the job-crushing inversions and foreign acquisitions of American companies that the Obama administration faced. There is no reason to tax our businesses into moving abroad, as the Democrats' proposals will do. Family farms and small businesses. Today, family businesses passed down at death are subject only to a state tax and not an additional income tax. Instead, a business's tax basis is increased or stepped up to fair market value, sparing the next generation a large capital gains tax bill. President Biden wants to create a double death tax by eliminating the benefits of this step up in basis, including for small businesses, farms, and ranches passed down from one generation to the next at death. More insidiously, the Biden plan would tax these businesses on simple inflation, sticking them with the bill for reckless inflationary tax and spend policies enacted by politicians in Washington. Capital gains tax. For decades, the Republicans and Democrats have recognized the importance of encouraging people to save for their future goals, including starting a business, saving for retirement, achieving financial independence, or even buying a home or a car. Members of both parties have long agreed on a key tool to encourage these goals for all Americans, specifically a lower tax rate on long-term capital gains. President Biden wants to nearly double this tax rate from 23.8% to 43.4%, which will be the highest rate, and hear me on this, the highest rate in a century. In many cases, when combined with similar state taxes, the government would take more than half of an asset's appreciation in taxes. This is the appreciation that lower income, middle income, and all income categories of workers and earners in the United States will have to pay. This supersized tax hike would be a powerful disincentive to small businesses, savers, and retirees, and entrepreneurs and innovators who power our economy and harm all Americans, regardless of their financial circumstances or goals. IRS funding and bank monitoring. The Biden administration has proposed nearly $80 billion in additional IRS funding of which $72.5 billion would be accountability-hindering mandatory spending. Nearly doubling the IRS's budget without increasing its accountability opens the door to repeating and supercharging the agency's past abuses of power. Further, the administration's proposal would press financial institutions, private sector financial institutions into reporting the deposit and withdrawal flows on their customers' accounts of greater than $600 in value. Now think about that. This isn't big corporations. It's not even just corporations. It's small businesses and individuals who have a financial account that has more than $600 in it. And what we're going to see is a dragnetting, law-abiding, a dragnet pulling law-abiding Americans into this exposing sensitive data to future breaches, burdening financial institutions, and encouraging the growth of shadow banking. What a huge violation of the privacy of all Americans. As if this proposal could not be worse, the data provided to the IRS would have almost no value in fighting tax invasion. The era of big data should not be viewed as an opportunity for Big Brother. The SALT deduction cap. While my colleagues are proposing reckless, across-the-board tax increases on businesses and families, they are simultaneously proposing to expand a tax deduction for the wealthiest, those living in high-tax states. Democrats are fighting to reverse the cap on state and local taxes, or what is called the SALT tax, these deductions, stoking a tax break for the very wealthy. Democratic silence on who benefits from their proposal is telling. 
per a 2020 Brookings Institute study, 96% of its benefits would go to the top quintile of earners. 57% would go to the top 1% of earners. And 25% to the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of earners. A huge tax break for the wealthy. And finally, price controls on pharmaceutical manufacturers. Thanks to the genius of science, private sector innovation, and the success of Operation Warp Speed, America is ready for its comeback. Unfortunately, my Democrat colleagues are proposing sweeping governmental price controls on the very innovators who have enabled our return to normalcy. Under the guise of negotiation, the government would be empowered to set a maximum fair price for drugs and apply bureaucratic standards that determine the value that cures and therapies bring to American lives. As the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office has confirmed, this type of scheme will lead to fewer new medications, threatening access to life-saving health care options for our most vulnerable citizens. One of these foregone therapies could treat pancreatic cancer. Another could cure ALS. While every patient should be able to afford life-saving medications, their proposal has the potential to eliminate the existence of these very inventions and innovations. Congress should come together in a bipartisan way to make all health care services, including prescription drugs, more affordable and accessible. And I've introduced legislation to do just that. We do need to reduce the cost of prescription drugs. But using the savings from this misguided government price control scheme to pay for unrelated partisan priorities is not the answer to the high cost of health care. Before the pandemic, a combination of reduced regulatory burden and pro-growth policies, including the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, helped to create one of the strongest economies of our lifetime. With all-time high medium, median household income, a 50-year low unemployment rate, and real wage gains month after month, especially and most for the low-income workers. Inflation-adjusted weekly median earnings grew 4.9% for the two years between 2018 and 2019, the fastest two-year growth rate in real earnings since 1998 and 1999. Polling showed Americans' general satisfaction at the highest level in 15 years. We would do the American people a disservice if we mortgaged their future while undermining the foundation of their past successes. And sadly, this is the approach that many of my colleagues are seeking to take as we move into the next step of this debate. We should instead be building on time-proven pro-growth policies, not reversing them to fund a reckless spending spree. Thank you, Mr. President.